Welcome to the third and final of our lectures in the Spring Policy Forum series. I'm Sarah Bates with the Center for Natural Resources and Environmental Policy here at the university. And we convene this series in partnership with a number of other organizations. And I just want to thank them really quickly. Uh, first of all, the School of Law has been just a tremendously generous host of this policy forum, providing the room and the audiovisual help and a lot of our advertising support for this. We also work in cooperation with the School of Forestry and Conservation, the Boley Center for People and Forests, the Resource Conservation Program, Department of Geography, Environmental Studies Program, Department of History, H.D. Hampton Lecture Series, the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, and uh, special thanks to MCAT for filming these presentations, rebroadcasting them locally uh, through our cable access channel and making them available for posting for people who aren't able to attend. So today's topic is the public trust doctrine. And this is a topic that, of course, is getting a lot of attention nationally and as a, an important topic for public resource management here in Montana as well. Our speaker is an excellent uh, person to present and reflect on this topic, Chris Smith, who brings years of experience in public resource management in Alaska and more recently in Montana. He's currently serving as the Western Field Representative for the Wildlife Management Institute and previously was the Deputy Director of Fish, Wildlife and Parks here in Montana. Before that, he uh, worked for 30 years, is that correct, in Alaska? <laughs> Which he, he met some of the people who are attending here today. Uh, Chris has a BS in wildlife management and fisheries biology from the University of Alaska and an MS in wildlife biology from University of British Columbia. Please join me in welcoming Chris Smith. Thank you, Sarah. Um, now you guys know a little bit about me. I want to know a little bit about the audience and in particular, I need to know how many of you are attorneys? <laughs> well, there's a, there's a few, great. Um, and, and the reason that I ask that um, is so that you can help hold me to a bargain that I made a number of years ago when I was uh, with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and advising the Board of Game on a complex and controversial issue. Sitting beside me was the Assistant Attorney General who was also providing legal advice. And uh, at one point after I had offered an opinion to the board, uh, Bonnie leaned over and very politely but clearly whispered in my ear, if you don't pretend to be a lawyer, I won't pretend to be a biologist. <laughs> so <laughs> from that point forward, I've tried to uh, toe the line between uh, claiming to be an attorney uh, when I'm not and uh, sticking to the policy side. So I'll try to do that today, but um, if I start to stray uh, across the line, um, you can pull me back. Um, as Sarah said, I'm going to talk to you today about the public trust doctrine. And if I can make this work, there we go. <clears throat> I want to try to answer a few basic questions as we go through here. The first of those is fairly generally, what is the public trust doctrine, you know, this legal uh, construct. Secondly, how did a Roman Empire, emperor provide you with access to Montana's streams and rivers and wildlife? I think that's an important question. Third, I want to talk about what the roles of government are under the public trust doctrine. Most of the public trust literature and oftentimes you hear discussion uh, talking about the government serving as trustee, but because we have a multi-branch government um, in the United States, I think we t need to take a little finer look. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drill down a little bit into the various branches of the government and, and what I think that means. Talk a little bit about your role as citizens um, or advocates, uh, whatever your choice may be, and, and why, that, why I think that matters. <coughs> 
So let's start off with just sort of a 30,000 foot flyover of the public trust doctrine and, and what is the public trust doctrine. And in essence, a public trust doctrine is a, a legal principle that there are certain natural resources, and depending on the jurisdiction, it varies as to what's included, but typically we think of air, water, particularly navigable waters, the submerged lands beneath navigable waters, fish and wildlife as these public trust resources. These are resources that are held in trust by the government and managed for the benefit of the public. So in its simplest sense, that's, that's what the public trust doctrine is. Now, the question is, where did it come from? Why is this uh, a component of our law? Most descriptions or accounts of the public trust doctrine trace its roots back to the Roman Empire. In early Roman law, um, as the concepts were developing, there was a recognition that there were certain things that could not be owned by any one person. They were owned collectively uh, by uh, society and civilization. And the first place that we see uh, a record of this concept is in the institutes, the Justinian Institutes, which were recorded in 529 AD. And um, that provided that you know, by the law of nature, certain things, air, running water, the sea, and the, the shores of the sea um, are common to all people. They're, they're owned by all people. Um, the Roman Empire, of course, extended into what we currently call England, which is where most of our law comes from. It stems from the English common law, uh, was brought to the United States, through the colonial uh, uh, era. And when the United States, uh, when the 13 colonies declared their independence from Great Britain, the sovereignty that had begun with the Roman Empire progressed to the King of England and then transferred down, uh, came to the United States uh, government. Now I'm going to talk about three Supreme Court cases. There the Supreme Court has ruled on public trust issues on a number of, in a number of different cases, but I'm, I'm just going to talk about three in particular to illustrate um, some of the history and evolution of the public trust. The first of these cases was um, a case called Martin v. Waddell. It was decided in, 19, in 1842, and it had to do with a conflict between a landowner who uh, could trace the title of his property back to a grant from the Duke of York, who had been given the land through a grant from the King of England. And that title claimed that, or asserted, that he owned not only the uplands, but also the intertidal lands as well. And he didn't like anybody else taking oysters off of his intertidal property and attempted to keep people from uh, taking those, those oysters. When this case made its way all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, Justice Taney uttered the first and clearest description of that pattern of uh, the transition of sovereignty that I, I mentioned earlier when in, in ruling for the court, he said, the dominion and property and the navigable waters and lands underneath them were held by the king as a public trust. And when the people of New Jersey, as part of the original 13 colonies, took the reins of government, declared their independence, that sovereignty tra transferred immediately from the king of England to the state. Okay. And what the king could not give away because he held those lands in trust for the people, neither could the Duke. And so the, the claim that was asserted uh, based on the title was found to be invalid. In a similar case, um, about 50 years later, uh, Illinois Central Railroad versus Illinois, the Illinois legislature had granted to the Illinois Central Railroad 
title to virtually all of the land along the shoreline in the Chicago Harbor. Um, and the railroad began developing that and, and asserting exclusive use and rights to the entire shoreline. Uh, a few years later, when the political mood changed and people realized what had happened in terms of losing their access, uh, free access to and from the harbor, the legislature repealed the act that had granted that property to the railroad. The railroad um, sued, and uh, as a result of the, the litigation, when that finally made its way to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ruled, as uh, in this case, as they had in Martin v. Waddell, that the state could not give away land any more than, than the king could. Now, they did qualify that and say that there are two exceptions uh, under which the, the state, as trustee, can alienate certain trust lands to private interest. That is, um, if it does not interfere with the public benefits or if it enhances the public benefits as a result of transferring. So it's not a blanket prohibition on, on the transference of, of trust resources, but it either has to enhance or at, at, at worst not diminish the, the public benefits associated with that. The third case, uh, which was decided in, in 1896, is Gear v. Connecticut. Now this case is often cited as the case where the Supreme Court established state ownership of wildlife. And in fact, for many years it did stand as, uh, as uh, meaning just that, that the state owned the wildlife. And in that case, uh, Justice White, and if you really want to read the history of that transition of um, uh, public trust responsibility from ancient Roman times uh, through to US law, if you read the opinion of Justice White, he chronicles that entire history. Um, now at the end, I'll give you a reading by a legal scholar from Oregon who thinks that Justice White got it all wrong and that there's a completely different interpretation. But at least as the law stands um, in the US today, what Gear v. Connecticut does stand for is clearly um, embracing wildlife in the context of public trust resources. This was a case uh, that related to an individual who had taken some upland birds in the state of Connecticut and intended to export them from the state. There's a state statute that prohibited that. Um, the individual fought that all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled, said, state owns this wildlife. They can say what happens with it. Subsequently, gear was overturned, but not with respect to this particular issue. What was overturned was the concept that the state owns the wildlife. But that's a whole other topic, so we're not, we're not going to get into that too much. So let's talk now about um, how the, the public trust doctrine I've described how it flowed through U.S. Supreme <clears throat> Court law. How does that apply in case law in the states? Well, in 41 states, um, in a, an analysis of the public trust doctrine that was done for the Wildlife Society a couple of years ago, uh, Gordon Batchelor and, and his co-authors identified 41 instances 40, in 41 different states where the public trust doctrine had been recognized as a valid legal doctrine in their, in their case law. In 21 of those states, public trust had been extended beyond navigable waters, which was where the public trust really started was in, in navigable waters. In English law, it pertained mainly to intertidal waters. When it began being applied in North America, where the major rivers were uh, uh, avenues of commerce, courts extended the, the public trust uh, to non-navigable waters um, as well. In 15 states, they found specific reference in case law where the public trust doctrine was applied to wildlife, fish or, fish or wildlife in, in various cases. 
With respect to where or the extent to which the public trust doctrine has been codified in either state constitutions or state statutes, very rarely does it show up in constitutional language. Now, uh, Alaska is one of the, one of the exceptions. Um, Sterling, who's, Sterling Miller, who's in the audience, and Colleen, Matt, and I all had the privilege of, of working in Alaska for, for many years. And there, the Constitution is very clear. It says, Where, wherever fish, wildlife, forests, grasslands, and waters occur in the state, they are common property to be managed for the people of the state. Very broad, very powerful statement in the Constitution. Most states have some description uh, or statement of the public trust doctrine in their statutes rather than in their, in their Constitution. In 48 of the states, there's a very clear delegation of management responsibility with respect to the, to the public trust. Um, in the two, one of the two states that I know of where it's a constitutional mandate is the state of Florida. I was down there in February doing a, a workshop with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. They had a constitutional initiative a number of years ago that established in their constitution the Fish and Wildlife Commission as the constitutional entity with a clearly assigned public trust responsibility for their uh, fish and wildlife. Most states uh, have a mission uh, or similar statement um, for their agency, the state fish and wildlife agency typically, or a natural resource agency that's consistent with the public trust doctrine. And 39 of the states have clear processes for holding the trustees accountable. We'll get back into that accountability a little bit later. So let's talk about Montana and what we have here in Montana. Probably the clearest articulation of the public trust doctrine or basis application of the public trust doctrine in Montana, in the Montana Constitution is Article 9, Section 3. It has to do with water rights. Subsection 3 says that all surface, underground, flood, and atmospheric waters within the boundaries of the state are property of the state for use of its people and are subject to appropriation for beneficial uses as provided by law. And it also specifies that the legislature shall provide for the administration, control, and regulation water rights. So here we have a clear statement in the Constitution that we have this common property in water that is to be managed and administered by the legislature serving as trustees for the, for the public in the administration of, of water. Now we're getting close to the answer to my second question. Uh, when we look at how that Montana law has been used and, and applied uh, within Montana, there are two cases that are particularly pertinent to the public trust doctrine. The first of those is the uh, Montana Coalition for Stream Access versus Curran in 1984, and the, the same plaintiffs versus Hildreth also in 1984. These are the two cases that form the basis for Montana's stream access law. And in these cases, the plaintiffs argued that the waters of the state were a public resource and that the public had to have access to that resource to be able to use it. Um, in discussing the public trust uh, doctrine with Bob Lane, who was the former chief legal counsel, uh, with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks recently and trying to think of other examples where the Montana Supreme Court has specifically reached to the public trust doctrine. Um, he couldn't think of any other, any other cases where they've gone directly to the public trust doctrine as the basis for their ruling. And they've had a number of opportunities because Bob, in fact, himself raised the public trust doctrine in some of his briefings and arguments before the Supreme Court. Um, so it seems as if the Montana Supreme Court knows it's there. They're not afraid to use it when it's appropriate, but it's sort of the biggest hammer in the toolbox, and they're not going to reach for it unless they, unless they need to. But clearly, in the cases of Curran and Hildreth, 
they felt it was appropriate. And in fact, it was probably the only basis upon which they could, could make rulings as broad as they did to extend the public's use, right to use the waters of the state beyond the limits of navigable, navigable waters where the state owns the bed and banks to in fact allow the public to use water even on private property. Um, the legislature subsequently adopted um, uh, Montana Code 232301 uh, and so forth, but 302 sub 1 is really the, the key uh, component of the statute, which provides that all surface waters that are capable of recreation may be so used with, by the public without regard for ownership of the land underlying the waters. Probably that one of the most powerful applications of the public trust doctrine in the United States, certainly many other states have not gone this far. And because the public trust doctrine is applied at the state law level, there are, every state interprets it differently, every state court addresses it differently. The Supreme Court in Hawaii has connected groundwater and surface water and said water is water and the public trust applies to it all and has reached very deep into uh, administration of water law in, in Hawaii. Other states uh, won't go there. But in answer to the question of how did a Roman emperor make sure you could fish on the Ruby River, this is it. Because you can trace the, the legal principle that underlies Curran and Hildreth all the way back to the, the institutes of Justinian. So let me switch gears a little bit now and talk about what a trust is and, and what's important to the public trust doctrine and how it works. In any trust relationship, you basically have to have three key elements. You have to have trustees, you have to have assets, and you have to have beneficiaries. And the trustees have a fiduciary responsibility to manage the assets in a way that protects the corpus of the trust and provides benefits to the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries have legal rights in terms of how they can hold trustees accountable, make sure that they're not um, failing to fulfill their duties, their, their trust duties. So in the context of fish and wildlife, and presumably water as well, although, I'm not, I'm not even going to pretend to be a lawyer in the, in the water arena. Um, typically, government is seen as the trustees, the assets are our fish and wildlife, and the beneficiaries are all of the people, every one of you, every citizen in Montana, whether you hunt, fish, view wildlife, simply know it's there, or potentially even somebody who is so distanced from wildlife that it's really not a part of their, their life or their consciousness, they still potentially are a beneficiary under the public trust. But as I said at the outset, you know, referring to government as the trustee paints with a pretty broad brush. So what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is kind of drill down into the structure of our government and talk about what the different roles and responsibilities are. We'll start with the judicial branch. Obviously, the judicial branch um, was really the origin of the public trust in U.S. law, most public trust doctrine law is common law, comes out of, comes out of various cases like the Supreme Court cases that, that I referred to. They're also the guardians of the public trust doctrine in that citizens have the opportunity if the trustees are failing to fulfill their obligations, um, the court is one avenue to redress those uh, uh, those grievances. So they, they, the court has a, has a very important role. Again, since I'm not a lawyer, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna get into things much further than that. What I will spend a little time though now is talking about the differences between trustees and trust managers within the other two branches of government, the legislative and executive branch. In my opinion, and um, I published a paper recently in the journal Wildlife Management um, arguing that elected and appointed officials in government 
are the primary trustees for the public. The legislature, the governor, and in Montana, the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Commission, and the director, who is a political appointee of, of the governor, are the individuals that I believe serve as the trustees for the state's wildlife. And I say that because when you think about the responsibilities of a trustee, I mean, they have a fiduciary responsibility to the beneficiaries. They have to look out for uh, the, the corpus of the trust. They have to weigh a lot of complex demands from the beneficiaries. And they have to make a lot of policy level decisions about how to allocate benefits um, from the trust. In a paper in the Journal of Wildlife Management a couple of years ago, uh, Cindy Jacobson and some colleagues suggested that um, in the ideal world, wildlife trustees would be qualified, competent, impartial, and assiduous to the interests of the beneficiaries. There would be a mechanism for their replacement if they prove deficient in any fashion. And that the beneficiaries should have the capacity to initiate removal and have some voice in their, in their replacement of trustees if they were not satisfied with them. Well, I can't speak to how assiduous or qualified or competent any or all of these elected and appointed officials are, but they certainly meet the other two criteria. As beneficiaries, you and, you and I as citizens of the state have the opportunity to evaluate their performance and every couple of years decide whether we keep them on board as our trustees um, or whether we replace them. Now the trustees' primary responsibilities are to maintain the corpus of the trust and its, and its ability to provide benefits, to allocate those benefits out to the competing interests and to consider the needs of all beneficiaries, both current and future, in making those decisions. And that last one, of course, is the most challenging part of applying, in my opinion, the public trust doctrine, particularly to fish and wildlife. Over the course of my career, the range of interests and the demands on the fish and wildlife resource has really broadened, and it's made the job much, much tougher. What about resource professionals? Um, I would argue that they are not trustees, they are the trust managers. And there's an important difference between the trustees who are directly accountable to the people. They can be replaced through the elective process. And resource professionals who are career civil servants, protected by employment law typically, when you see uh, litigation filed against the Department of Fish and Game uh, or Fish, Wildlife and Parks in Montana, they always name the director. They never name the biologist or the administrator that was responsible for carrying out the, uh, uh, carrying out the policies. The resource professionals I see as having a very different set of responsibilities than those policy level folks. So what are those? Well, first of all, obviously they have to monitor the status of the trust. Um, it's part of their day-to-day -day duties is keeping track of, of the health uh, of the resource. Identifying potential benefits. Determining what are the trade-offs. How can you provide certain benefits from the resource? And obviously informing both the trustees and the beneficiaries, the public, as to what those trade-offs and options are so that people can argue and cuss and discuss and, and figure out how to allocate those, those resources. And historically, those, those first three um, or, or four bullet points, first three, I guess, were uh, fairly typical resource professional jobs. You went out and you counted deer, you counted fish, you, know, you did various things like that, wrote up management plans that had options and, and kind of threw it to the, threw it to the wind. As things have become much more complex, though, and people have become more engaged uh, and more interests uh, are demanding benefits from the resource, I think an important role for wildlife professionals is informing 
trustees of the, of, the, of the interests of the beneficiaries. Somebody has to do that. And you know we can rely on public meetings or opinion polls or this, that, or the other thing. But the field of human dimensions within uh, natural resources has really matured to the point where I believe it's on a par with the biological sciences in terms of its ability to inform decision making. In addition, I think wildlife professionals need to become very active in facilitating dialogue and conflict resolution among beneficiaries. And that was good timing. <laughs> One of the best conflict re resolvers in the world just walked in the room. At any rate, um, if the agencies and the professionals don't work at bringing competing interests together and trying to identify ways to resolve their conflicts and bring the trustees well-rounded uh, solutions that can meet the broadest possible means, what you end up with is management that flip-flops back and forth as the political winds shift back and forth. So I think this is an incredibly important part of modern uh, resource management. Finally, um, and this is a point that there may be some debate on when we uh, get into questions here in a few minutes, I think it's the responsibility of professional resource managers to manage the trust as directed by the trustees. And it's important that managers do the best job they can to minimize the extent to which their personal values or beliefs influence their decisions or how they go about doing their jobs. Now, I'm not going to suggest that there aren't many cases where the trustees are failing to do their duty, where they are not protecting the corpus of the trust or they are not adequately or equitably allocating resources. But if resource professionals try to fill that gap, I think they make two mistakes or fall short in two areas. First of all, that enables continued failure on the part of the trustees to do their job. To some extent, they're being shielded. Their dereliction of their duty is being shielded from public view by the fact that the professionals are kind of filling in the gap here. Secondly, in my experience, it really ticks them off. And you cannot function effectively as a professional in the resource management arena if you don't have a credible and effective working relationship with those elected and appointed officials. Because ultimately, they do control the purse strings, the policy decisions. And if you want to be able to influence those decisions to the greatest extent possible, I think you need to respect their authority and, uh, and work with them as, as best you can. Finally, let's talk about beneficiaries. All of you and all the citizens of Montana, what rights do you have under the, under the public trust doctrine? Well, first of all, you have the right to demand that the trustees and the trust managers protect the corpus of the trust. That is our collective wealth, the fish, wildlife, the water in Montana. That's what makes Montana such a tremendous place. And so you have the right to expect that those trustees will protect that. Second, you have the right to uh, expect that they'll consider your needs and interests in making decisions. Uh, many of the, the government processes, decision-making processes that uh, we have in Montana are designed to provide you that opportunity to, to express your interests. And then third, you have the right to expect that they, the trustees will provide you benefits from the, from the resource. But there's two important caveats associated with that. The first one is that whatever benefits you derive have to be consistent with the capacity of the trust. In other words, you can't be expecting to withdraw more from the, from the Fish and Wildlife Resources than it's capable of, of supporting. And secondly, you have to recognize that in meeting your needs, the trustees have to consider the competing needs of others who may want something very different from the trust from you. Of course, the politics associated with that process is what makes this job or this line of work so fascinating. So what about your responsibilities as beneficiaries, the citizens of Montana? What are your responsibilities? Well, I would argue that, first of all, you need to understand what the public trust doctrine is and what it means. 
And I appreciate you guys taking the time to, to be here today and hope that this may have helped in, in some, some degree. Second, you need to learn about the status of the trust assets and the potential benefits that are out there. Become an informed beneficiary. Learn about the health of the fish and the wildlife. Learn about the status of water in the, in the state and, and what the potential benefits are and how those align with your interests and values. Express your interest to the trustees and the trust managers. There are a lot of opportunities out there and ways that you can participate um, in decision making and I would encourage you to do that. Um, same time, recognize the rights and interests of your fellow citizens. If you don't respect other people's values, then you certainly don't have any reason to expect that they're going to respect yours. Um, so we, we have to find ways to, to seek collaborative solutions whenever we can. And then finally, hold the trustees and trust managers accountable. That's one of your uh, responsibilities. Because if you don't do it, nobody else is going to. I can assure you that. So how can you do that? There's a, at least three ways that I would suggest that you can and should um, fulfill your responsibilities and exercise your rights under the public trust doctrine. First of those is exercise your right to vote. You know, when you walk into the ballot box in a couple months, think about the fact that the person that you elect to serve in the legislature or to serve as the governor will either directly as elected uh, officials or through the people they appoint, they will be making those top level policy decisions that affect the fish and wildlife and waters of this state and the benefits that, that you receive from them. Secondly, participate in government decision making, whether that's testifying at the legislature, submitting comments on a proposed plan, engaging in problem solving with uh, various agencies, tremendous opportunities to have an influence um, on decisions related to the trust. And because there are some attorneys in here, I have to point out that you can always litigate. Um, and litigation, as was evidence in the case, the Curran and the Hildreth cases, where plaintiffs felt that they were their interests and their rights under the public trust doctrine were not being adequately addressed through law and could not, could not achieve their goal through legislative means initially chose to litigate and were able through that litigation to, uh, to implement the, the public trust doctrine. So there, there is always that option. So I guess in conclusion, and to leave us some time for Q&A or, or discussion, uh, the public trust doctrine is deeply rooted in our, in our history, thousands of years of, of thought and philosophy and, uh, that under, underscores the public trust doctrine. And that has come to be codified in our laws through court cases, in some cases through, in you know, some situations through constitutions, through statutes, and so forth. The public trust doctrine is central to fish and wildlife conservation and to water law um, in Montana and in the United States today. Um, and we all have responsibilities under that public trust doctrine, whether you you know, are elected to office and serve as a trustee, or you work in an agency as a trust manager, or you're just one of the beneficiaries. Um, all of us have rights and responsibilities to fulfill under the public trust doctrine. It's incredibly important that we do that. So for the benefit of the students in the room, I'll just throw up, here are some um, suggested readings uh, Joseph Sachs' paper in 1970 um, is often cited as sort of the seminal legal uh, uh, work um, documenting the public trust. Uh, Horner's paper argued uh, for expansion of the public trust to include wildlife. James Huffman, this was the paper that I referred to earlier. It's the individual who has a very different take on the public trust doctrine, who uh, considers uh, ancient Roman history and English common law very differently than most other public trust uh, scholars. So it's probably worth reading through, uh, uh, reading through some of his work and, and the uh, references that he cites. 
Slade's book um, in 2008 was actually the second um, book that he prepared on the public trust. The, f the first one um, uh, covered the earlier history up through about uh, the mid 90s, was commissioned by the Coastal States Organization, I think it was. Really good summary of the public trust uh, and how that has evolved. And then the, the last one is a shameless plug for the paper that I published in the Journal of Wildlife Management that really was targeted at state fish and wildlife agency professionals and, and how I think state agency professionals can be most effective. So with that, I'll throw it open to uh, questions and see how well I can handle them. And we are, because we're taping this, we want to capture the questions on the mic, so. Give me a moment, I'll turn this on and ask that you speak into the microphone uh, with your question. Your discussion of the relationship between the trustees and the trust managers generally makes sense, but I'm wondering whether you have considered that as public employees, the trust managers are themselves trustees. Under the common law, public officers and employees are public trustees. The Montana State Code of Ethics for public officers, employees, and legislators says explicitly that holding public office is a public trust. So I'm wondering, since the trust status, the trust relationship is so important, whether it might not make sense to say that everyone in the system is a trustee, the employees might be considered co-trustees or sub-trustees. There's obviously a division of labor, a separation of powers. I'm not questioning that the trust managers have to follow the direction of the elected officials, but I think the importance of the public trust doctrine may be reinforced by recognizing that they're all trustees. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. Um, I think, um, and having spent 35 plus years in the business as a as a resource professional, um, you know, in two different states and now in a, in a nonprofit um, organization, um, it's an incredibly difficult position to be in because, to some extent, you do have the responsibilities or obligations of a trustee. At the same time, you are a, still a citizen. So you are a potential beneficiary as well. Um, in, in, the, in the paper that I, that I wrote, I drew that distinction in part you know, to try to caricaturize the difference between elected and appointed officials versus civil servants, because I think there, there are some important differences, but I don't, I don't dispute your basic point that, that as part of government, they are part of the trustee body. I have a question that has two parts to it. Or I'm going to illustrate it with two examples. I attended a program years ago about um, some wildlife managers who were able to finally apprehend a person who had killed an eagle. And of course, that was illegal. And it took a lot of effort on their part to um, get the evidence to get this person arrested and brought before a court. And I'd like to switch to another related instance uh, in a book I've read by David Roberts called Searching for the Old Ones. Uh, the Anasazi treasures uh, would be Native American ruins, um, pottery and other things like that are protected under the Antiquities Act. And in the state of Utah, uh, a pot hunter was especially egregious in his violation of the Antiquities Act, and with a lot of effort, the B Bureau of Land Management uh, um, employees were able to gather enough evidence to get this person and arrested. In both cases, the judges basically did almost nothing. It was a slap on the wrist. It was, you know, like time served or a very minimal uh, fine. And in essence, um, <clears throat> I came to the conclusion that the judges had very low regard for people who violated the, um, the resource that's protected by the public trust. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how judges view the public trust and their apparent lack of respect for it in some cases? 
<laughs> well, I, that might, depending on how I answered that, could get me in real trouble. Uh, but I, you know, the, the simple answer is, of course, you know, judges are people too, and and, and they each have their own uh, their own values. Um, but I think the, an important theme underlying your observations, and it's one that I've wrestled with a lot in thinking about this question of, in particular, legislators as trustees. Um, and in fact, I was challenged after publishing this paper by a, a number of folks to develop a, a, some sort of educational materials or a course for legislators so that they would, in fact, understand that they are trustees and understand what their obligations are under the trust. And I think it's the, the same point comes back in, to the judges in the case that uh, you referred to. If they either don't understand the, their responsibilities under the public trust or don't understand what that means or simply don't value those public trust resources, then that's going to affect their decisions. So again, that would be an opportunity, um, whether you're a citizen um, or in the case of an, an attorney arguing a case in front of a in front of a court, to make the case on the importance of those public trust resources and the obligation of the court to uh, uh, to protect the public's interest in those. Yeah. I'm relatively new to the state of Montana. So maybe you could tell me, there are probably recall rights with regard to the governor, and probably recall rights with regard to judges. Um, this is a sort of a follow-up to your question. Do you, to your knowledge, do you have, um, is there any case or any instance where a judge or an elected official was recalled because of his violation of his duties under the public trust. I don't have any personal knowledge of, of those circumstances, but perhaps someone, someone versed in the law here does. Got a few in, lined up here. Thanks. Uh, I'm curious if you see the public trust doctrine as having the potential of actually limiting what a state legislature or state wildlife commission can do in terms of, in other words, does it provide, in, in your opinion, any concrete guidance about sp specific policy disputes and how it's applied? Access disputes, for example, or proposed game farms or anything like that. So do you, do you believe that the, the trust doctrine can be applied in a way to actually limit what a state legislature can do in terms of, of wildlife management? Um, I, I can think of it, at least one example. Um, if the legislature were to um, adopt a statute or consider adopting or, or adopt a statute that allowed um, a landowner in Montana to construct a high fence around his or her property and in the course of doing that enclose um, wildlife and then that landowner was able to um, use that wildlife in some exclusive way. I think that would be a clear violation of the public trust doctrine. Um, in the case, uh, a case dealing with a game farm on the outskirts of Yellowstone uh, Park, um, there was uh, a game farm operator who made a habit of leaving his gates open, allegedly so that any elk that got into his pastures could get out, but he would conveniently you know, close the gates when they were in rather than after they were out. And, uh, Multiple occasions he was taken to court and convicted of, of illegal activity. Um, and while the public trust doctrine was never explicitly argued as the basis for the laws that um, uh, under which he was charged and, and eventually convicted, um, clearly that I think that the theory applies in that regard. Um, if um, and if a possible other example would be if the legislature were to adopt a statute that um, would result in irreparable harm or damage or loss to an important 
fish or wildlife resource. Uh, I think you could, you could make the argument that you know, unless you could demonstrate that that was an insignificant loss or that it somehow provided other benefits that outweighed the, the loss, that you could make that argument. But now I'm really getting out there on the, on the edge where I probably shouldn't be. So. Dan. Hi, Chris. Um, I have a concern about trustees in Montana when it comes to the public trust doctrine. The Fish and Wildlife Divisions of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks get 97, 98% of their monies from hunters and fishermen. Uh, in Montana, I think it's 16, 17% of the people in Montana hunt. Um, the beneficiaries are everyone. The jobs of your trust managers are dependent right now on having more hunters and more fishermen. Is that a, a good formula for having the trustees manage in the best interests of the assets and for all of the beneficiaries? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, I think in the long run, the institution and the funding of the Fish and Wildlife Management Institution at the state level has to change for a couple of reasons. Um, one is simply a practical reason. Um, revenue from hunters and anglers um, is declining. The number of hunters and anglers nationally is declining. While the demands on the Fish and Wildlife Agencies are rapidly expanding. So, you know, just from a practical standpoint, uh, something, something needs to change. Coming more, though, to your, the, the heart of your point, if all of the people of the state are beneficiaries of the state's fish and wildlife, um, it's not equitable that only a portion of the beneficiaries are paying the cost of maintaining that public trust. And um, it certainly sets up the appearance, if not, in fact, a real conflict of interest where you have um, an agency that is so financially dependent on a segment of the public to whom they are responsible, um, managing, managing for, the, for the broad range of interests. And that's a building conflict that I see across the country uh, because those interests that have traditionally funded and to a great deal controlled state fish and wildlife agencies, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of fear and trepidation out there about losing that control and, uh, and sharing, the, sharing the influence over agency decisions. So, yeah, Sterling. Yeah, I'll, um, thanks for a stimulating presentation. I, I'd like to build off the first question, uh, uh, which is about who the trustees are. Uh, you've emphasized in your talk that the trustees are the state legislatures, and uh, and yet there's confusion when you know Migratory Bird Treaty Act and Endangered Species Act and so forth. Do the state legislatures, re you know, I mean, it's not always that clear, and it appears to be shifting who the trustees are. Right, and you know, with 30 minutes to try to talk about 2,000 years of history, um, I had to skim over a, a lot of things. And I focused primarily on state trust responsibilities. There are corresponding federal trust duties and responsibilities. The responsibility for endangered species, migratory birds, marine mammals, all of that has been um, granted to the federal government through acts of Congress, through the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, so forth, the, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, for, for bird treaties. So in those cases, I guess I would, if I were making the parallel argument, it would be that Congress and the elected and appointed representatives of the federal government have that primary trustee responsibility on the, on the federal level. Oh, yes. 
I would go a step farther and, and say it's not restricted to those particular laws that uh, call out a particular type of animal. I think the Kleppe decision makes it clear that uh, any law passed uh, pursuant to the property clause of the Constitution, the, uh, the, re the trust responsibility lies with the federal government. And so on any federal land, because all of our federal lands are designated pursuant to the property clause, the ultimate trustee is the federal government, is it not? Not the state government. <laughs> we, could, we could argue for days over that. <laughs> but, you, but your point is well taken, that, that it isn't just um, under those specific uh, federal statutes pertaining to those um, categories of, of wildlife or wild animals, but also um, for f on federal lands, federal agencies do have certain trustee responsibilities as well. You know, and just because I try to be as collaborative and cooperative as I can, you know, I, I would prefer not to get into an argument over whether, you know, it's the state versus the federal government and a shared responsibility, you know, collaborative uh, approach would, would be more constructive. In the back. I think we have a couple oh, of people okay. queued up um, and we may be running out of time, but I'm okay. sure you'll be available to speak to people now. Thank you. Uh, I have a little conundrum going around in my mind that I've been dealing with and it has to deal with the Otter Creek coal tracks and um, the habitat that will be disturbed over there if those are developed, the habitat for sharp-tailed grouse, sage grouse, uh, species of concern, elk, deer, uh, the fisheries and water quality and the tongue and the, the powder river. And uh, the idea of harvesting the coal out of it is a good idea when you want to turn electricity on when it's burned for that, but then the, the byproduct of that are uh, toxic waste is the air and mercury and things like that. So those costs to society are, are never ever figured into the whole equation of developing the coal tracks. And we have our trustees up here in charge of both sides, the development of the, re of the coal resources, plus they have the re responsibility to maintain the, the, the public trust of the, the wildlife and the fish over there. So I don't know how it's going to play out, but it, it concerns me and I worry about it, although I shouldn't because I can't do anything about it. But anyway, that's my <laughs> comment. <laughs> well, I think you, you point out um, why being a legislator would be an extremely difficult job. Um, and despite my personal feelings about some legislators, I, I really do respect the work that they do and the challenges that they face. I mean, they're charged under the Constitution. I mean, the same document tells them, you know, on the one hand, you have to protect these natural resources, and on the other hand, you have to, you know, assure the economic development of the state. So we're constantly trying to, to balance those. Um, and, you know, we live in an incredibly complex political system. Um, it's far from perfect, but, you know, it's, that's the one we got, so you play the hand you're dealt. Our last question, question in the back. Um, you covered uh, land and fish and wildlife pretty well, or um, water and fish and wildlife, but can you speak to the trust obligations for land? There are um, articles in the Constitution to manage the school trust um, for the beneficiaries and for full market value. There's also the land board uh, that we didn't touch on, which had the decision over the Otter Creek coal tracks. And it's fish, wildlife, and parks, and the, the habitat piece there. Well, I'm tempted to say, thank you very much. We're out of time. <laughs> um, I, have not, um, I have not spent much time looking into or thinking about issues specifically related to school trust lands, other than you know, when, when I was with fish, wildlife, and parks, we obviously dealt with, with uh, state land management issues, but um, off the top of my head, I would probably be best not to, not to try to go there in any depth right now. So. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for this. And